A History of the Yoruba People. S. Adabanji Akindi. Before Uduwa, Ife in the 9th to 10th century. All available evidence indicates that by about the beginning of the 10th century, each settlement in the Ife group had attained very high levels of economic, political, religious and social complexity, and that the group as a whole was poised for major transformational change. When that change came, it was so great that historians today are generally agreed that it amounted to a revolution a revolution which not only transformed Ife but triggered a movement of profound change and transformation for the whole of Yoruba land. Much is known today about the great developments in Ife in about the 10th century AD. It is also known that by about the 11th century those developments had lifted Ife above every other Yoruba community in every sphere of human culture. The generality of Yoruba people then and after, ought by the image of Ife, transformed that city and their thoughts and folklore into a place of myth, mystery and legend. Ife became the first place that God created in the world, and the source of all earthly existence. For the Yoruba, Ife was on day Ea, the place of creation, Ariran, the source of life, Ibiojutin Moa, the place from where the sun, or enlightenment, rises. It was generally believed that Ife was so close to heaven that one could meet one's departed forebears in its streets, and that in some hidden shrine in Ife could be found the gate to heaven. The gods that watched over the Yoruba race were believed to have their primary abodes in Ife. In later centuries, when communities in other parts of the Yoruba land rose above Ife to greater heights of political and military power, the consensus and convention lived on that Ife's territory was inviolate to all Yoruba people, because to assault the Ife kingdom was to upset the supernatural guarantees that sustained order in the world. When, in the late 19th century, Ila Ife was destroyed in war and lay in ruins, the oracles warned gravely from all corners of Yoruba land that the Yoruba country would never know peace until Ila Ife had been resettled and accorded the respect and honor due to it. Yet Ife's early greatness did not have its root in the mysterious and mythical, but in the concatenation of advantageous earthly circumstances. The present chapter will attempt to describe the economic and other developments in the Ilu Ife in about the 9th or 10th century. The story of the revolution which followed upon those developments will be the subject of the next chapter. As pointed out in previous chapters, then, we have the suggestion that there were 13 settlements in the Ilu and the Ife Bull by the 9th or 10th century, Amalagan, Parakan, Okoha, Ilurin, Odin, Idita, Ilaromu, Awinrin, Okawo, Ichogb, Ire, Imojubi, and Ito. However, it is important to note that there have also come down to us a few other important names not included in this list of 13. These include Ida Yamu, Ilara, or Inobadu, and Idio. Also, some of the bigger settlements among the 13 headquarters that were quite substantial in their own right, whose names keep showing up as separate settlements a fact which tends to introduce some confusion into our attempts to ascertain the list of settlements. Finally, once the revolution commenced, the events occasioned by it were violent, tumultuous and long drawn out, and they caused the destruction of many settlements and the temporary emergence of others. The fact that the names of these settlements tossed about in the whirlwind of events also keep occurring in the traditions tends to add much to our difficulties. The consequence of all this is that, in the present state of our knowledge, our list of the 10th century Ife settlements is no more than tentative. All that we can definitively say, therefore, is that by the 10th century, there were many settlements dotting the area of the Ife Bowl an area with a diameter of about 20 kilometers, 12.5 miles. Isola Alamila has made efforts to identify the locations of the better known of the settlements. According to his findings, Ilaroma lay along a stretch of today's Ife Ilesa Road, Idita, remembered as the largest of the settlements, lay along today's road to Makaro, Odin lay along the modern road to Ifwara, Ichug, Okoha and Array were situated a few kilometers west of modern Modak with Ere being the farthest southwestwards, Alar and Asija occupied the sites of today's Sabo and Ule, respectively, Awinrin covered the area of today's Koiwo and Orana quarters, Amalog uncovered part of what is now the campus of Obafemia Wolawa University, Imojubi lay along the modern Ife Ono road on the outskirts of today's city of Ila Ife. The sites of Ito, which is said to have been a large settlement, Okawo, Ilarin and Parakan are difficult to ascertain. Each settlement comprised at least a few quarters each quarter being an intricate complex of compounds, or Agboila. If some physical difficulty, like a stream, a piece of marshy ground or a rock, had made it necessary to leave a sizable gap between quarters, some quarters could look like self-contained settlements in their own right. Thus, for instance, Ijug consisted of four contiguous villages Aran Yiba, Ida Asan, Ipa and Igbog, and Adida consisted of three Lael, Ilasan, and Ilya. Each Agboila was a large sprawling building consisting of a number of courtyards. 
a picture of these settlements in their last years of existence can be easily pieced together from traditions still vibrantly alive in many quarters of Ila Ife today. Many of the Agbo Ila were very old buildings. During dry seasons, there was a lot of roof repairing and roof replacement activity in every settlement, as well as of wholesale remodeling and improvement of some of the oldest Agbo Ila. Many Agbo Ila were proudly beautiful buildings with carved wooden posts and doors, and murals on the walls of the courtyards. Usually in preparation for festivals, the women worked on these murals, cleaning them and renewing their paint, and there was much rivalry about this. Some of the traditions claim that potsherd paving of floors was already an old practice, and that some courtyards where kings lived were so paved. Some shrines experienced more decorating and more beautifying than even the richest Agbo Ila. In every settlement, there was much activity in the building of new Agbo Ila, food was plentiful, weddings were many. Each settlement was ruled by its own king who was also its high priest. Each quarter in every settlement was ruled by a high chief who was subject to the authority of the settlement's king. The quarter chief performed priestly duties for his quarter. In addition to his duties in his own quarter, he also served as an advisor and assistant to the king. In the process, some of the quarter chiefs had become so exalted that their titles rang out nearly as loudly as the titles of their kings. This is yet another reason why it is sometimes difficult today, when studying the traditions relating to this era of Ife's history to be sure which titles belonged to kings and which belonged to quarter chiefs. Every Agbo Ila had its own compound head, its oldest male member, who led the compound in ritual matters and dealt with small day-to-day -day matters peculiar to his compound. All relations in this whole system of government of a settlement were deeply rooted in religion religious and spiritual bonds, proprieties, obligations, rituals. It is very clear in the traditions that a ruler in any of those Ife settlements of the 10th century was, much of the time, more a priest than anything else. The king, or chief, and the shrine belonged together, and the shrine was the heart of the settlement. The power of religion, the reality of supernatural sanctions, upheld and preserved the whole system. Every settlement was surrounded by intensively cultivated farmlands. As a result, the whole Ife Bowl was one expansive area, largely free of forests, crisscrossed by paths, a hub of human activities. Various kinds of crafts kept each settlement busy and generated a daily traffic of people between settlements. Each settlement had its own marketplace which opened every fourth day, and therefore women going to sell and buy were on the move between the settlements every day. The names of some of the settlements seem to indicate that they were generally recognized for certain special services. For instance, Okowo roughly means village of the herbalist or diviner, and Okoha the settlement where the marketplace is located. While it is not known for sure whether these settlement names describe their special functions in the area, it is known that some marketplaces had become, over time, bigger centers of trade than others, so the traders came to them not only from the Ife settlements but also from settlements in more distant parts of the country. Some Akiti traditions strongly indicate that one Ife marketplace acquired the stature of a central marketplace in the Ife area. According to Alamla, relying on some versions of these Akiti and Ijesha traditions, such a central marketplace did exist under the name of Oya Igbamoko, and traders came to it from as far away as parts of Akiti. In early times, the people of the Ife settlements were known collectively as the Igbo and Igbamoko therefore probably meant a place for the gathering of the Igbo, for buying and selling. The settlements in the Ilua Ife were therefore very close, not only physically but in many other respects in their day-to-day -day pursuits, in their commercial life, in their sharing of special services, etc. The exogamous nature of their marriages interconnected all the settlements in a giant cobweb of human relationships. Consequently, significant events in any settlement, a festival, a wedding or a funeral, drew relatives from all the other settlements. By the 10th century, each settlement had grown so old and so diversified that some marriages could be contracted between persons of the same settlement, but most persons were the offspring of mothers married from other settlements. Some farmlands happened to be more desirable than others because they were known to receive more rains usually, because they drained better, or because particular crops were known to do especially well on them. Therefore, Farms belonging to farmers from different settlements tended to get interlocked in some areas, even though rigid respect for the traditional boundaries remained the norm. Some settlements became known as the leading producers of certain farm products. For instance, Ijug became generally recognized as the leader in the production of yams, which means that Ijug regularly produced large quantities of yam surpluses for sale. The other settlements generally believed that Ijug's success with yam cultivation was the result of a special favor from its protector god, but the cause probably, was that Ijugb's part of the farmlands was more suitable for certain types of yams. All the settlements also accepted the god of Ijugb as the special giver of rains, the god to make sacrifices to for better rains for the farms hence, the saying, 
if the rains fail, make sacrifices to the god of Ijug. In consequence, Ijug acquired some special prestige among the settlements. Progressively too, long-distance trade was becoming a major factor in the Ife group of settlements by the 10th century. Reference has been made to the traditions of parts of eastern Yorubland concerning traders from those parts to Ife markets. The same traditions have it that the reason for the increase in this long-distance trade to the Ife area was that Ife was the only place to procure certain foreign, exotic, goods in the earliest times. In an article first published in the Journal of the Historical Society of Nigeria in 1979, Robin Horton looks at the agricultural, commercial, and industrial sectors of the economy of Ife by the 9th century, and concludes that by that date Ife's economy generally was experiencing great expansion. As indicated in Paul Ozan's article earlier referred to, the Ife farmlands were mostly very fertile, received adequate rains in the rainy season, were mostly well-drained, and were not prone to catastrophic erosion. These conditions provided the base for successful farming from the earliest history of the Ife settlements. That the settlements took good advantage of them and accorded agriculture the highest priority is shown in their traditions. Thus, we have the traditions relating to Orzateko, who is said to have been the hero, or god, who brought yam from heaven a tradition which, most probably, suggests that some species of yams were domesticated in the Ife farmlands. Another version of the Orzateko traditions, however, has it that Orizateko was one of the most prominent people in the revolution that occurred in the 10th century, a strong man who resisted Oduduwa very successfully for some time. We can be sure that this means that big farmers were heroes in the settlements, and that farming was a very prestigious occupation there by the 9th century. This would seem to be confirmed by the traditions, earlier referred to, that Ijugba enjoyed special prestige as a settlement because it produced rich surpluses of yams. Also, the cultivation of the Kalanet appears to belong to early times, and this crop seems to have become a very important one in the economy of the Ife area by the 9th century. The same appears to be true of the type of kola known as Oragbo, Kola Garcinia. By the 9th century, before Oduduwa, Ife was already a major producer of oil palm products, palm oil, palm kernel oil, palm wine, etc., as well as of the raffia palm, raffia vinifera mostly palm wine. As will be related later in this chapter, Obatala, Oduduwa's most important opponent, was much given to these wines. By the 9th century, then, Ife was a center of very prosperous agriculture. Such healthy agricultural production stimulated the growth of population. The traditions to the effect that new Agboila were always being built in all the Ife settlements by the beginning of the Oduduwa revolution testified to the growth of population, which, in turn, supplied more labor for agricultural production. Also, and very importantly, the production of surpluses in agriculture created a strong base for the growth of trade both local and long-distance trade. For the early development of trade across the Niger with the West African savanna, and beyond, through the Sahara to the Mediterranean world, Ife occupied a particularly advantageous location. Directly south of the point at which the valley of the Niger describes a southward bend, the West African tropical forests also bulged northwards, so that a route from the Niger Bend to this forest bulge provided the shortest connection from the Niger to the forests for the exchange of savanna and forest products. Ife lay in the middle of this forest bulge, making it a natural terminus of the earliest central north-south route in this region of West Africa. This made Ife the earliest center of the north-south trade in the Yoruba forests and established it as the earliest great commercial center south of the Niger. The trade stimulated the production of some goods and the gathering to Ife of others. The interaction of production surpluses and trade established the foundations of wealth. Ife thus began the journey into greatness economic, cultural and political much earlier than the rest of Yoruba land. Other routes developed to connect this central route to other regions of West Africa. One such route pointed northwestwards to connect with the ancient city of Gao on the upper Niger a city that by the 9th century was already a considerable center for the river Rhine trade as well as a terminus on trans-Saharan routes, and was later to become the capital city of the Songhai Empire. That a route such as this was already a factor in the Borgu and Yoruba region by the 9th century is, according to Robin Horton, indicated by a number of traditions and cultural evidence. Another route seems to have pointed southwestwards, connecting in the Ijebu forests with an ancient lagoon trade running east-west. The T-point junction of the two routes developed to become the commercial city of Ijebuod. About the existence of an early east-west lagoon trade, there is much strong evidence. E.J. Ilagoa has shown that a strong body of Ijo oral traditions points to the early existence of such a trade between the Ijo and the Ijebu waterside, oral traditions that seem to be confirmed by surviving traits of cultural connection between the Ijo and the people of the Ijebu waterside. 
Robin Horton does not mention yet another route the one that almost certainly existed very early from Ife eastwards and southeastwards, along a general corridor consisting of the Igesa, Ekiti and Owo countries, and that was later to provide the connection between Yoruba land and Benin. There seems to be no doubt that such a route already provided commercial and cultural links between central and eastern Yoruba land by the 9th century or earlier, as would seem to be indicated by Ajesa, Ekiti and Owo traditions, by the discovery of potsherd payments in Osi, Ekiti, and Ipil Ijesa, and by considerable evidence of links between Ife, Owo and Benin sculptural art traditions. Perhaps the earliest export merchandise of Ife to the north was Kalanut. The earliest scholars to study early Kalana trade in West Africa came to a conclusion that left out the Yoruba forests as a source of Kalana for the trade with the savannah. They postulated that the principal type of Kalana involved in the trade was the Kolanadita, Goro, which existed in the western parts of the West African forests, modern Ghana, etc., but not in the Yoruba forests, and that the typical Yoruba type of Kalana Obia Beta was not a significant part of the trade. They also thought that the principal route of the Kalana trade started around Kumasi in modern Ghana and ran through the Niger Benta Houseland, bypassing Yoruba land. In more recent times, however, these opinions have undergone some serious modifications. Babatunde Ajiri has pointed out that Kola Kuminata was also almost certainly a very significant item in the trade, as was perhaps also Oragbo. This would make Ife a major player in the Kalana trade. Horses from the north were almost certainly also a part of this early trade. Some historians used to think that horses did not feature in the trade of the savannah with the forests until about the 16th century, but many scattered pieces of evidence now seem to contradict that view. The presence of a horse's head as a motif in ancient Igbo Ukwu brass art indicates quite strongly that horses were indeed known in the forests south of the Niger from quite early times. That conclusion is supported by some evidence from Yoruba traditions. Particularly strong evidence is found in the mention of horses in at least one verse of Ajuifa. A strong body of Ife royal traditions is unambiguous that horses played a significant part in the import trade of Ife during the reign of Odudua, in the late 10th or early 11th century. One Ariki of Abo Kun, Odudua's grandson and founder of the Ilesa kingdom, describes him as Okun Rindudu or Yesen, black rider on a horse, and some very ancient shrines in parts of Yoruba land had sculptures representing deities riding on horses. It is also known that some centuries after Odudua's time, the rulers of the Benin kingdom in the deep southeast used horses, partly as prestige items, but partly also for very important communication. In spite of the difficulties created by that setsi fly, horses appear to have been a regular part of the penetration of savanna animal species from beyond the Niger to Yoruba land from very early times. The most probable conclusion, then, is that that setsi fly did not totally exclude horses, it only made them rare and for that reason horses were prestige possessions of rulers and of the most important shrines. Ife most probably had a monopoly of the trade in horses in Yoruba land for a long time which would account for the southern Ekiti proverb that he who desires to own a horse must buy one from heaven through Ife. Ife also seems to have been a major center for the earliest distribution of salt in the Yoruba interior salt produced by processing sea water in various parts of the coast, mostly by the Ijebu, Itsukiri, Ilohe and Ijo, and imported into Yoruba land through the Ijebu coastal towns. Salt from the Sahara later came to enhance the volume of salt in Yoruba land. Dried fish from the coast appears also to have been a major item of the ancient trade, and so was palm oil sold to the savanna lands in the north. Akiti and Ijesa traditions also indicate that Ife was the earliest market in which to procure leather and leather goods, as well as exotic herbs and herbal preparations from the savanna and the Sahel, and potash from the Sahara. The use of cowrie shells, Ooao as currency had very probably begun in the Ife market before the 9th century. Widespread Yoruba traditions point to the Ife as the first users of cowries in Yoruba land, a fact indicating that the earliest cowries came through the Trans-Saharan routes. Imported from the Indian Ocean through the Middle East, cowries were used in Ife not only as money but also as ritual jewelry and ritual decoration. Cowries seem to have quickly spread over the Yoruba and Edo forests, to be imported also through the coast by the Portuguese after the coming of European trade centuries later. By the 9th century, then, Ife was a center of considerable agricultural and commercial prosperity. But Ife was also prospering as a center of industrial production and already experiencing increasing manufactures of iron, beads and various other products that were to make it by the 12th century the greatest manufacturing and artistic center in the West African forests. For the existence of a very strong iron industry in Ife by the 9th century, before Odudua, the evidence is unambiguous. Ife appears, indeed to have already become the major center of iron production in much of West Africa by that date, 
as well as a supplier of raw iron and iron manufactures, tools, implements, artifacts, to much of Yoruba land. The shrine of Ogunladen, deified blacksmith of Oduduwa, in front of the Yunus Palace, has a pear-shaped hundredweight of raw iron which was made in Odujuwa's time. This, clearly, is a work of very skilled blacksmiths a level of skill which already existed before Oduduwa. Abundant evidence of a vibrant early iron industry has been found in other parts of Ife. For instance, excavations by P. Garlic at Obalarisland and at Woyasiri have revealed, among other things, large quantities of iron nails, some of which seem to have been used in some large wooden construction. Even more importantly, the garlic excavations unearthed iron slag in two years, clay pipes through which air was passed into furnaces, clear evidence of an iron smelting industry. And, as it would seem, we do not have to look far to discover the source of the iron-bearing raw clay for a smelting industry in Ife. Paul Ozan points to iron stone quarries in both the southeast and northwest outskirts of the ancient city, from which raw materials were dug for smelting. Long before Odudua then, Ife had an iron smelting industry and many blacksmiths workshops producing a large variety of iron goods in quantity. Such a strong base for the production of farming tools in iron was one of the major factors which boosted agriculture, which then had serious impacts on population growth and the expansion of commerce. But the production of large varieties and quantities of iron products must have impacted almost all areas of life the volume and quality of Agbo Ila construction, plastic hard in all mediums, long distance travel and, eventually, the political ordering of the Ife group of settlements. Ife also had a growing industry in bead production. In later years, under Oduduwa and his successors as kings of Ife, this bead industry was to grow into a very major source of wealth for Ife people, but its beginnings belonged to earlier times than Oduduwa's. The two types of beads produced in Ife were the blue, dichroic glass beads known as sagi, and the red tubular type known as ian. Concerning the source of the raw materials for Ife's bead industry, there has been some debate among scholars. Some believe that Ife bead makers did not get their raw glass by smelting original raw materials such as potash and silica, both found in ashes and sand, but by remelting glass from glass products imported from medieval Europe through the trans-Saharan trade routes. In support of this view, some evidence exists of such remelted imported glass in some of the Ife beads. However, other scholars have pointed to equally conclusive evidence of original smelting of glass in Ife, as indicated by the findings of some archaeological excavations in the city. It is important also that some Ife traditions have it that iron smelting and glass smelting generally went together as twin pursuits. What most probably happened, then, is that in the high heat processes of iron smelting, or perhaps even pot firing, the exposure of potassium rich wood ash, together with silica and ordinary sand, to very high heats, yielded Ife's earliest quantities of raw glass. Thereafter, facilities were established for regular smelting of glass for the production of beads. Then, a long time later, under Oduduwa and his successors, when the bead industry became very large, bead producers began to melt any glass to augment the raw glass from the smelters. Ife was an exporter of some beads before Oduduwa, through Ijeba traders to the coasts of West Africa, and through other traders to the Niger and beyond, especially to the Noob country. With the coming of European trade in later centuries, European traders bought a type of bead called Akori in the Alida area and resold it on the Gold Coast. It has now been suggested that this Akori bead was in fact Sagi bead from Ife. Besides these manufacturers, Ife was also an early and major center of production of cloth, pottery products, oil palm products, raffia products, certain types of mats, raffia woven baskets commonly used as containers in long distance trade, herbal preparations, etc. All in all, then, by the 9th and 10th centuries, Ife was a great and growing economy, certainly the richest and most dynamic place in the whole of the Yoruba forests. Even in these very early times, Ife was already a place of considerable artistic activity. In a recent monumental work on Yoruba art history written by Henry Drewell, John Pemberton, and Roland Abiodun, the following stages and years in the development of art in Ife have been proposed. Archaic Era, before 8800 Pre-Pavement Era, 800, 1000 Early Pavement Era, 1000 to 1200 Late Pavement Era, 1200 to 1400 Post Pavement Era. 1400 to 1600? Stylized Humanism Era, 1600? The present of these eras, only the first two concern us in this chapter. During the Archaic Era and the Pre-Pavement Era, that is the centuries from about 350 BC, when the first Ife settlements arose, to about 1000 AD, 
the people of the many small settlements in the Ilu and Ife decorated their lineage compounds and shrines with wall murals and paintings, as well as with carved and painted wooden posts and carved doors. They also produced beautiful clay figurines, as well as carvings in stone, and molded iron figurines most of these, almost certainly, for decorating community shrines, Agbo Ila shrines, and the abodes of rulers. Some of their stone sculptures were studded with iron nails a sort of artistic expression whose purpose remains unknown to us. The Ife people of this period, especially the later centuries of the period, appear to have initiated the practice of beautifying some floors and courtyards by paving them with potsherd, pieces of broken pottery, and stones. Some of their most important shrines, and the abodes of some of their rulers, were, according to Ife traditions, decorated in this way. Probably by, or before, the 10th century, some art in bronze or brass casting may have begun in the Ife settlements. Many archaeologists and historians believe that bronze-slash-brass casting did not start in Ife until about the early 11th century, but this is probably because much of the bronze-slash-brass art of Ife has not been dated. At Igbo Ukwu, east of the Niger in the same forest zone as Ife, clear 9th century dates for bronze-slash-brass casting have been obtained. Since it is fairly certain that the copper for bronze-slash-brass casting at Ife and Igbo Ukwu were importations into West Africa. It seems very probable that both places obtained the raw materials and practiced bronze-slash-brass casting at about the same time. By the 10th century, Ife had, as earlier pointed out, become a market of considerable importance as a terminus of the trans-Saharan trade the early source of copper imports to West Africa. At any rate, the very high quality of Ife bronze-slash-brass art by the 11th century seems to be positive proof of some earlier beginning than the 11th century. The growth in population in Ife by the 9th century increased the sizes of the settlements, and growing prosperity enhanced the quality of life in many ways. Very importantly also, Ife's prosperity attracted increasing numbers of people into the area. Many of these were traders and others who ended up becoming members of the existing compounds and lineages, but increasing numbers were not getting so absorbed but tended to constitute a sort of floating population. Also, small coherent groups came seeking to establish settlements and share in the prosperity of the Ife area. In the face of all these developments, the traditional political arrangements in the Ife Bowl could not possibly survive for much longer. From their various beginnings, each of these settlements had managed its own affairs as an autonomous kingdom religiously, so respected by, and respectful of, its neighbors. The traditional political leaderships clung tenaciously to this old order of things, but clearly the old order was due for radical change. At first, and for some time, according to the traditions, the people in control of the old order compromised a little by allowing some change. The kings of the settlements worked out some system of cooperation among themselves, a sort of alliance, or confederacy, according to Abiodun Adadiran, over which one of them presided as a sort of chairman. The details of this arrangement are not very clear, but, according to Adadiran, the alliance was a very loose one. Membership was voluntary, and it was presumed that any of the kings could pull out at will. No central chieftaincy institution was ever considered, and every kingdom kept its autonomy and separate existence. Apparently, there developed some increased collaboration in ritual matters, allowing the chairman to call for, and preside over, joint sacrifices to the gods for the common welfare of all the settlements. But the chairmanship was not permanent but rotational, so that when the chairman died, the position passed to the king of another settlement. The oldest one among the kings, according to some traditions, was elevated to the vacant position an arrangement which tended to make the chairmanship change hands frequently, thus guaranteeing that no chairman would develop undue ambitions. So far were the kings ready to go and no further. As it turned out, this arrangement proved very unstable. Even soon after its inception, conflicts surfaced. The first chairman of the alliance, according to most versions of the traditions, was Orinth, ruler of the Or settlement. He soon confronted some major challenge to his leadership. The nature of the challenge is not clear. Probably he found that some of the kings in their settlements would not accept his leadership in certain matters, or even that some of them conspired to replace him or abolish the alliance. According to the traditions, he survived the challenge and secured the support of the majority of the kings and settlements. A minor conflict seems to have occurred, since the traditions describe Orinth supporters as running through all the settlements proclaiming. Bogbo Iluo Ohir, all people in this Ilu, Emosoni to Orinth Orinth has no rival. Orolomo Nife Orinf is undisputed leader in all Ife, Ilu Bogbo, Orolo Nife. Let all in the Ilu hear that. Most of the kings who occupied the position of chairman after Orinf do not appear to have fared well at all. The last of them was Obatala. 
In the very many traditional accounts of the events of these times in the history of Ife, the image of Obatala is generally a very unflattering one. Most versions of the traditions represent him as an alcoholic who was in the habit of getting drunk and falling into a stupor when he was needed to attend to important matters. Some versions represent him as a man crippled by some bodily deformity. It is difficult to miss in these traditions the tone of contempt for the leaders of this alliance arrangement. Almost certainly, what these traditions are trying to convey is that the system of alliance was grossly inadequate for the needs of the times, and that the men who led the alliance were incompetent. Ife was ripe for real change, 